Welcome everyone to the final SAV educational webinar of 2023, Role of Artificial Intelligence in Lung Nodule Management with Dr. Mehta. A few reminders for the audience. You all are in a listen-only mode and are currently muted. If you have questions for Dr. Mehta throughout his presentation, please use your question feature to submit them. It's located on your control panel in a little drop-down arrow with a box. We'll address all the questions at the end of the lecture. At this time, I'll hand it off to Dr. Hussam Nayef to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Nayef is the chair of the Industry Relations Committee here at the SAB, and he also sits on the SAB's Education and Program Committee. Dr. Nayef. Uh, hey, thank you, Emily. Welcome, everyone, to our Society of Advanced Bronchoscopy Educational Webinar. Your host is uh, Hussam Nayef. We present to you on a monthly basis discussions and reviews on advanced bronchoscopy and interventional pulmonology. Today, we have an exciting topic and our speaker, Dr. Mehta. Uh, Dr. Mehta is the, direction, the Director of Interventional Pulmonology at the Lung Cancer Center of Nevada, a division of Comprehensive Cancer Center and also the Department Chair of Pulmonology at Mountain View Hospital, both in Las Vegas. He has completed his um, fellowship in pulmonary critical care at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City and an Interventional Pulmonology Fellowship at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. Uh, his growing interest and expertise lies in the application of artificial intelligence in pulmonology, especially in the product development. He's also the founder of pulmonary.ai.com. So without further ado, um, Dr. Mehta. Thank you, uh, Dr. Naif. I appreciate the kind introduction and I uh, wanted to thank the SAB for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, interesting interesting topic. So I'm going to speak on the role of AI in lung nodule management. Um, pulmonary AI is a fledgling enterprise and in interest. Um, CCC Nevada is the website for, for where I work. Um, in terms of disclosures, these are my consulting and advising uh, disclosures. I think it's as important to talk about what to expect out of this lecture. We have to remember the pace of change and the pace of updates is, is pretty remarkable. Um, I will be using product names to make the lecture relevant and the focus will be um, on the breadth rather than depth. This is not um, in-depth, detailed discussion of p-values or anything like that. The goal is to give an overview um, regarding basic terms in AI and how they relate to medicine AI applications in lung nodules, and then limitations or challenges as we um, employ those. Um, and I acknowledge that I'm responsible for the content of the talk. Uh, so that's kind of the outline I briefly spoke about. I also touch upon software as a medical device, which is what really we are seeing, and then different ways AI is interacting with lung nodule management. Um, in terms of the definition of AI, this is more so my personal opinion, a non-biologic system capable of modifying output based on either the same um, or changing repetitive inputs. And that's that's the intelligence part, that's the learning part. Um, also the hierarchy of I, disclosure or disclaimer, this is just my opinion. You have identification. So you identify patterns, for example, from DICOM data, a step above that would be interpret those patterns and say, oh, this is a spot on the lung, crudely put. Then what do you infer from that? You infer that this could be cancer. What's the insight? Could be cancer if the patient is smoker. And then you have true intelligence, which is indistinguishable from um, human intelligence. In terms of the AI classification or, or logic tree, we would broadly classify AI as weak AI, strong AI, um, and then artificial general intelligence. Machine learning is another term we're going to be hearing a lot of. It's a subset of AI, and there are supervised machine learning algorithms, unsupervised, and then those that are part of reinforcement learning. Putting them all together, we see what are they made of, um, or, or rather a subset of machine learning would be deep learning, and that rather is made of neural networks. It's analogous to the human brain. The um, similarity is, is intentional, and these neural networks function as the building blocks of deep learning. And again, you have artificial neural networks, convolutional neural networks, or recurrent neural networks. So AI um, applications, again, somewhat broadly speaking, can be weak AI or strong AI. It really is not so much the strength or robustness of the application, but more the breadth 
of um, use. So a VKI application would be a narrow use example looking at lung nodule only. Strong AI application is algorithm that perhaps will run on CAT scan and pick up um, lung nodules, um, bone density per fractures, um, emphysema score, coronary artery calcification, so on and so forth. There is different um, modalities here. Broadly speaking, you have computer vision, which is looking at pictures, natural language processing, which is looking at words, and then um, AI applications in speech, which is speech recognition and speech generation also. This is again the similarities with the um, human biologic system. So you have the AI, which is the, uh, or the algorithm, which is your larger organism. Then you have machine learning, which is analogous to the organ system, deep learning as a subset, which is the organ within the system. And then the tissue structure, which is composed of um, neurons and cells and that, or they form the neural network. It's worth touching upon over here, what is radiomics? A very simple definition is radiomics allows us to access data in a CAT scan that the human eye cannot see. This can give you information on tissue heterogeneity, um, diagnostic implications, certainly prognostic implications, and perhaps at some level, information from the whole lesion versus a biopsy giving you localized um, information. And I use the quotes there um, because here the lesion is not really the lesion, but it's the, the lung tissue. And I'll touch upon this later where there's an application showing use of information, even in the absence of lung nodules, can help predict lung cancer risk. This is um, a nice scheme of um, radiomic use. So you have training data sets which highlight then the region of interest. They look at different features and identify candidate features. Then those features are selected that can best predict um, outcomes of interest and together these make the um, model. Most of this is fairly evident. Um, you know, why would AI work well for lung nodules? Well, lung nodules, as anybody who's um, worked with them, you get better the more you do it. So repetition and pattern recognition is an important need here. And this is certainly a strength of AI. There's also a need to process vast quantities of images and reports. AI does not fatigue, can analyze images well. Uh, AI can also, just like we do, and a bit better sometimes, make estimations of risk of um, scans it looks at, and also make future predictions of risk. In terms of how AI might function, here if you see a square, the darker the red is, the more the area of concern, the darker the green is, um, the less the area of concern. This is kind of a heat map of this uh, lung nodule, and together these numbers are um, crunched, and then you get a score, and the score says, hey, this is our level of concern or not. A very important point in assessing the suitability of uh, AI algorithm is how was it trained? You know, The data, which is the training data, can be split into two sets, and we'll see that. So you derive a training set, and then the same data can be used to test the algorithm. Versus external validation would be to use um, data from completely different um, common source and then see if the algorithm can function similarly on diverse numbers of um, data. So example, if you have an algorithm trained in the US, does it function well in East Asia? Does it function well in Africa? So on and so forth. The better the algorithm is, the better the performance would be. And, and that depends a lot on how it was trained. Worth touching upon supervised learning as well. In supervised learning, we match inputs to output and we use inputted labeled data. This is cumbersome because um, somebody has to label the data, but it's um, successful and it helps teach the algorithm and learn. In unsupervised learning, the algorithm will find clusters in the data, isolate these clusters, and then try to find similarities within the clusters. Um, and I'll talk more about FIT in upcoming slides. So AI model development in, in medical imaging kind of functions like this. Collect the data, annotate the data, clean the data, 
use the training data to then develop the model and then test it. And that's really where the crucial step is, you know, how was the uh, model tested and was it tested on external validation sets? And then you continue to have uh, research output. The software that we are going to interact with are um, software as a medical device. This is to be distinguished from software in a medical device. So for example, if you use your robotic navigation platform, there's software as part of it. That's more software in a medical device not so much the software itself being the medical device. These um, applications are certainly purchases tend to be subscription based and there's pluses and minuses. The plus being there's no need for physical hardware. Um, maybe you can cancel at any time depending on what the contract looks like. It's easier to upgrade. You don't have stuff um, taking up space, so to speak. Yes, there is some um, virtual space being taken up, but these are things we're gonna to have to think about increasingly. As far as the FDA goes, majority of these algorithms fall under class two, which is uh, moderate risk. And this is a, a nice paper that looks at um, medical devices that are being marketed for AI or machine learning capabilities. Are they being appropriately marketed, meaning is the language consistent with the 510k clearance? So here you can see majority of the devices or software study were in radiology, no surprises there. And then, <coughs> excuse me, in cardiovascular disease, the researchers found that 80% of the software were consistent with marketing and the um, FDA summaries definitely re leaving room for um, improvement. This is again a very nice paper um, by Dutch researchers. They're doing great work in the space. They looked at 100 commercially available devices. They found that there is a rise of orchestrators or platforms, meaning these are um, software systems which sort of can function as plug and play, that you can say have a lung suite, so to speak, you can plug um, different aspects of lung AI. And I'll go through some of those examples. Um, seven vendors address multiple organs, um, more examples of strong AI. Um, otherwise it was mostly narrow AI. So going through here, we found most of them are, or at least half of them are FDA class two, very few, just two of them, FDA class three. In terms of the pricing model, that's sort of what we expect. Majority have um, subscription as a main feature. Some of them have paper use on top of the subscription model. Few of them really were just paper use. And as far as deployment goes, um, again, a large chunk with hybrid deployment that is cloud and local. Here they looked at the ratio of products that have been validated with data from different number of scanner manufacturers, centers, um, or countries. And here we see that most of them say had two or five countries that they had uh, data validated from. And the other um, material you can see as well. Going briefly through computer vision, this is the most common kind of AI that you may encounter. And this is the kind of AI that we may um, see. They are made of um, deep learning neural networks. Essentially, you have an input layer and an output layer. In the middle, there are hidden layers or layer. These layers consist of neurons connected via weighted edges. So what that means is if you have a picture of a sky and you have an object in the sky, and you ask the question, is it a bird, is it a plane? And the AI will see blue sky. And if it sees um, material that it's going to classify more as metal or a smoother texture that will increase the weight to say this is more likely to be a plane. If there are interrupted textures, maybe that's more a feather, so it's more likely to be a bird. Similarly, how to distinguish between cat and dog. And the neural net software has to run through multiple iterations of this. And that's where supervised machine learning comes into play, being able to supervise the software and say, okay, what we are looking at makes sense even to human context. This is analogous to the human brain 
and the outcomes are then compared to ground truth. Um, I'll go over that later again. This is direct assessment of the pixels. I would contrast this with natural language processing. This you can think of as looking at the words on a text. Now, words on a text can mean many different things. Context is very important. It's also hard to train these systems because you have to have large, large quantities of annotated data. For example, if you have medical notes and you have the words DNS, is it deviated nasal septum? Is it dextrose normal saline? Different words mean different things in context, especially medical jargon does not follow traditional rules and traditional grammar. So this becomes very, very um, difficult to do. This is a simplified scheme of how such a algorithm might work. You have all your input data, history, physical exam, notes, discharge summaries. These are narrative notes. These are unstructured. And then they go through the analytical engine to extract the concepts and the concepts are laid out and then um, associations are sought. And different words have different meanings in different contexts. And that's, that's where the hard part comes in. If you go online and take a look at um, AI applications in pulmonology, I strongly suggest going to AIforradiology.com. This is just a um, scroll of the website. There's a lot of stuff here, and these applications continue to increase in um, quantity. I'm not going to go through all of them. This is, again, a nice paper showing FDA-cleared applications for AI and lung nodule management. And here's the other list, and I'll try and go through most of these, at least the high points. Um, starting off with natural language processing. So this is from Eon, where they go through the words um, on CAT scan reports, and the words will go and be sorted, and the goal is to find lung nodules. So you find a lung nodule and then look for other words to um, make that word nodule more meaningful. Is there a characteristic um, called speculation? Is it punctate? Is there comments on margins? Have or has the radiologist mentioned where this uh, nodule is located? Have they mentioned is it solid, part solid, or, or not? Is there enhancement? Is it the word lesion? Is it the word spot? This is um, also from their website. There are disease specific um, modules. And you know, one can see at a um, broader level how some of this may be applied that you have a nodule that was found in a CAT scan of the neck, but it was a nodule in the lung. How you distinguish that from a nodule in the thyroid on the same CAT scan? You have a CAT scan of the abdomen, you have a nodule in the lung, but it was a CAT scan of the abdomen. How do you distinguish that from, CAT, uh, from a nodule in the liver? And all of those go into relative weights, and that's kind of how um, at some level natural language processing works. Going over to blood-based testing, and is there any applications that utilize the AI for blood-based testing for lung nodules? Yes, there is. Um, split test from Biotestic, which is a classifier assigning different weights to proteomic features and clinical features, and then gives you a risk prediction for the malignant potential of the nodule. Um, AI back development was used for machine learning based error correction and preventing um, overfitting. So it's worth talking about fit here. Overfit basically happens when you have um, a data set that has pieces of information that are far larger than the trial subjects. So the model becomes very rigid. You know, the model only works well in the discovery set or your training set. And then if you want to use this for validation sets, the model does not work as well. This brings us to what is desired fit versus perfect fit. It's kind of like the um, better is the enemy of good concept. So using the desired fit, you kind of loosen some of the overfit and make the model more compliant. And that permits um, it to function sort of as a master key that can work in validation sets as well, not just the discovery set. Going into one of the AI applications, um, this is from Viology, which is uh, Medical Solutions. This is a good scheme 
for how most of the applications function. You get data, input it into PACS. PACS sends it to the software, which could be local, cloud, or a hybrid deployment. The software either identifies the nodules, gives you risk score, whatever its um, intended function is. That information is conveyed to the reader. The reader incorporates that data. Um, report goes back into PACS, and we um, carry on. So going through um, this example, you can see that at the baseline scan, the location has been identified. Status for this ground glass nodule is new. Type is ground glass opacity. Here's the size. And what's the malignant prevent, um, potential? As you see, the nodule continues to grow, and this has been tracked over uh, the subsequent months. As the size increases, malignant potential also increases. So this is a pretty good example of nodule identification, nodule tracking, and uh, malignancy risk prediction. Here they looked to see um, how their software performed in the analysis data set, and they found that with use of the AI viewer, there was increased agreement between the observers who were reading these scans. They also found that the mean reading time was um, much less with the um, help of the AI software. Similarly from um, Siemens, so here you can see on the right side of my screen and then a um, little bit on the left side of this drawing, a couple of nodules being identified by the software. This is a um, prospective um, single center study looking at 390 CT scans of the chest, randomized to be read with AI versus without. And with the AI software turned on, uh, significant improvement in the time it took to, to read the scans, 93 seconds or 22% reduction in reading time. So definitely beneficial to speed things up and free up um, time for radiologists. This was um, another study where they used one resident and one attending radiologist. And um, the time was actually more with the AI software on. It didn't reach uh, statistical significance and more meaningful for the resident than the attending. They also did find additional actionable findings in um, five out of um, 40 cases without the increase in uh, reading time. Now I'll go through another application. So this is AI-based um, vessel suppression. So as you can see, the images roll on. Scan on the left with vessels visible, scan on the side with vessel suppression turned on, and that helps highlight the nodules more distinctly compared to the previous one. Very, very cool. Here, this is a paper showing a significant increase in malignant nodule detection with vessel suppression turned on, and also in actionable nodule detection. And these are cases where the ground truth was known, where you have cancers, and benign nodules. Malignant nodule detection also went up and the time it took to make these identifications decreased with the AI software turned on. This is a retrospective study, I'm sorry, of the um, same software in 100 cancer patients and radiologists in two groups with and without AI were analyzed. The AI group had higher nodule detection, higher inter-reader agreement, shorter reading time, but also higher false positive results. This is an, another paper showing the substantial agreement of AI volumetric analysis with reference values of the human. So human radiologists went and annotated the software, um, uh, annotated the nodules, I'm sorry, software was run on that, and the agreement between the volumes measured by the AI correlated very well with that of the radiologists, and this is this is important because volumetric tracking is something um, that I don't think we do enough anecdotally speaking, we certainly do you know, single dimension size measurements, but we know the role of volume doubling time. Now, vessel suppression for the same software was studied in addition to automated detection. And these are sub-solid nodules, mostly previously we had seen solid nodules. Here you have two thoracic radiologists providing consensus and they found with the vessel suppression turned on, um, nodule detection improved for both the readers. The accuracy of the vessel suppression on part solid nodules was 
better with the AI than accuracy on the raw images. Here is the lung cancer um, prediction software with convolutional neural network backing for uh, Optelum. And this is a good scheme. Again, you have input slices here which go into the software. Um, features are computed and the nodule is described. It goes then through the classifier which outputs a malignancy risk score. Here we have the software being trained on the NLSD data set. Uh, likelihood scores were given from 0 to 100 percent. This is important, right? There's external validation and external validation at two institutions. One is in the US and the other one is in the UK with prospective and retrospective. So a lot of robustness to um, how this was done. And this is a computer vision software looking at the actual images and pixels. Clinical variables, interestingly, were found to not contribute to the risk score and they were excluded. I certainly think that's a strength because we don't always know the clinical um, vignette, perhaps, that's entered with all the CAT scans. And if you have an incidental nodule, you may not get any clinical um, vignettes either. either. Of course, though, this was on an LSD data set. So here we see that the lung cancer prediction convoluted neural network models so has a superior AUC to Mayo and um, Brock, and that's the model here in pink. In the UK, the study was done at three UK hospitals again for the same software, um, looking at the Brock score. All cancer diagnosis had histological ground truth. The um, score had actually better discrimination and allows a larger percentage of benign nodules to be identified without missing cancers as compared to the Brock model. So significant strength demonstrated. And again, in pink, you have the AUC superior for the LCP versus the leads, Nottingham Oxford data set, and that's maintained in the overall data set as well. This is just an example of size, uh, showing that all things are not equal. So on the left side, we have benign nodules. On the right side, we have malignant nodules. These are nodules size eight millimeters, benign malignant. Um, next one is size 10 millimeters benign malignant, and then 12 millimeters benign malignant. Here we can see for this eight millimeter nodule, the risk score is 2.1, so lower is better. And for the same size nodule, because of the speculation to somewhat um, plural retraction, score is higher. Again, for size 10, more benign features versus malignant features are the same, same size. And then again, you have it at size 12, nice, smooth nodule, low risk score, but the, the same nodule that's more cavitary, very high risk score for malignancy. So that's you know one of the places where you may find improvement by having um, AI software running and being able to look at radiomic features, which are not easily apparent to the human eye. Um, now we have a multi-reader, multi-specialty study. Scans were evaluated with and without the lung cancer prediction. Convoluted neural network, equally split into benign and malignant nodules. And again, confirmed malignant on histology or fear stability for benign. So another strength here demonstrating the presence of ground truth. So the readers estimated the risk and made recommendations as to what they would do. And then they were given input from the AI and we can see if they changed their uh, changed their score. So here you see the improved AI under the curve with the addition of the software. So you can look on the bar chart. These are the improvements for all the different readers with the uh, software turned on. This is um, phenomenally interesting research. So this is out of um, MIT and um, that part of Boston. Sybil is a publicly available model with annotations, and this is open source. So the hypothesis are twofold. One is to see if a deep learning model can assess the entire volumetric data of a scan, and can it predict cancer risk by using all that data in the absence of demographic or clinical data, and also, can future cancer risk be predicted without a nodule being seen on the scan? So here, uh, the development was based out of three sets of data through NLST, MGH, 
and then CGMH, which was in Taiwan. Interestingly, never smokers can also be screened in Taiwan. So that's definitely different compared to the usual population we encounter for screening. Um, this is a good example of um, guided attention. So here you see software picks up the load of CT, does volumetric analysis. Um, through the encoder, we have different set of features that are identified. Some of these features receive guided attention. The guided attention refers to the annotations for training. So the annotations guide the attention of the software to features of significance. And using these attention features, combined with the features that the software picks up, the global features, through the hazard layer, then you get the software that's able to give risk prediction. So here, we can see the um, curves for the software compared to, uh, sorry, within the NLSC data for, and also MGH and CGMH. Here, if we were to examine Sybil's accuracy in predicting future lung cancer on the test set, one year AUC 0 0.92, two years 0 0.86, and that's maintained to 0 0.75 over um, six years. Interestingly, Sybil also maintained performance across age, sex, and smoking history subgroups. In the test set, the C indices were um, comparable to the NLSD um, set as well. This is a, a very interesting uh, example. This is red circle is emphasis, uh, my emphasis. Here's a patient who had a low um, LRAD score, LRAD2, and a high Sybil risk score. What's interesting about this over here is there's no visible nodule. Patient is 69 year old male, 99 pack year history. And two years later, the patient had a nodule that was identified that was non small cell lung cancer. So, yes, the software is able to predict lung cancer risk in the absence of current nodules. This software runs in the background, there's no radiologist input. And another strength is no clinical context is required. You know, how, how much you use something like this, say you have um, low risk nodules, you can reduce the amount of follow-up you want to do, and maybe you prioritize patients for, um, prioritize scans, I'm sorry, for higher risk patients. Maybe even in the absence of nodules, um, almost sort of like pre-sense minority report where you have these patients who have high civil risk scores and maybe you have your algorithm that's running in the background, maybe it's plugged in to another um, AI orchestrator, which I will talk about. And you have different algorithms. You have one algorithm that looks at lung texture to identify your valve patients. You have another algorithm like simple maybe that just keeps churning and then you get a list. And if a patient in two consecutive years is Sybil score high, for example, they get called in, talk to them through your pulmonologist and you then put them on maybe for another three years, keep scanning them and see if the nodule develops. I don't know, this is just my opinion. The software generalized well in the validation cohorts, but again, um, one of the limitations was in the NLSD, a relative lack of black and Hispanic patients. Also, this was on retrospective data and need prospective um, validation and then additional considerations have to be given to the potential for um, screening populations because um, that's where this was validated. And perhaps this would function differently in the incidental part. This is a interesting software. So there's, there's a lot of words on here. Um, the main thing to remember is um, the fact now that we're gonna be scanning patients more and more, obviously there's a lot of radiation exposure. So could we perhaps use ultra low dose CT which has radiation doses approximating that of chest x-rays to do the low dose CT cancer screening or ultra low dose CT cancer screening. How do we then use low dose images, lower quality images? Can those images be cleaned up? And that's where this application comes in. So DLD is deep learning based denoising. Now, in this study of 252 nodules, patients underwent standard dose CT, and you can look at the radiation dose in here, 6.4 um, millisievert on average versus ultra low dose CT, very, very low radiation dose. The study runs with three radiologists who evaluated um, these, these sets of 
different image processing protocols on a five point scale. So they evaluated them for noise, streak artifact, um, clarity, clarity of vessels, and overall image clarity. And also evaluated five sets on um, LRADs and tried to score them with LRADs. So the subjective score showed that ultra low dose CT with deep learning denoising was superior to using ultra low dose CT without deep learning denoising. And this particular model or a particular protocol showed the best scores among ultra low dose CT. Basically, what you can use here for the lung rads evaluation is the more words they were, the more sophisticated the algorithm, better the agreement was between the radiologists. This is an example of a AI orchestrator, very interesting. So you have here um, different applications. This is, I, I would say, um, strong AI, where you have software that runs in the background and it will identify, for example, RV to LV size, um, different kinds of disease by doing airway analysis, looking at the texture of the lung, screening patients by looking at the density of the lung tissue and seeing maybe there are valve patients, also scoring coronary calcifications and um, volumetric uh, analysis for aortic aneurysms. And then you can plug into this a um, nodule application. So going through this scheme, so you have all these CT tests being done through day to day, goes through the bio software and the software will then parse out data and send them to different nurse navigators so now you're looking at your copd or your emphysema um, patient population those go to perhaps your valve clinic the ild pe peh populations goes to maybe advanced lung disease or um, transplant clinic nodules go to ip advanced bronchoscopy cardiology gets another list um, as well similarly you have an orchestrator from Bayer, the european conglomerate the interesting thing here is they and also in bio use um, riverine as a vendor so this is really a marketplace where they have different vendors plugging in their applications and it's, it's very interesting to see how that may um, evolve as we continue to encounter more of these applications within um, usual clinical practice. This is a busy slide, but really the concept is the same that you get studies going through your packs. Um, those get sent to the orchestrator. The orchestrator will send them to um, different subgroups or working groups. The results are launched in the context of the study. Radiologist looks at them, looks at the additional information from the AI, annotated results go back, and it uh, keeps on keeps on going. This was relatively recent, and I was looking to see if I can find an example. Is there AI doing um, bronchoscopy? You know, we spoke a lot about looking at lung nodules, tracking them, giving risk estimation, so on and so forth. So this is autonomous medical needle steering in vivo. Um, example of software and in a porcine model basically doing autonomous bronchoscopy i'm just going to read out three sentences here i think that will convey all we need to know we introduce a medical robot that autonomously navigates a needle through living tissue around anatomical obstacles to a target in vivo once the start pose of the sterile steerable needle was set using the aiming device the system autonomously steered the needle from its current pose to the target. And we demonstrated successful performance of our system in multiple in vivo porcine studies, achieving targeting errors less than the radius of the clinically relevant lung nodules. So now you have AI um, to improve cost. Now, um, briefly, I'll go through some of, these, some of these limitations because it's not all very straightforward. The black box concept basically comes into play when you have a software and the software gets very very complicated it's hard to sometimes understand especially in unsupervised learning how the software makes its predictions you know in supervised learning we guide its attention and we say these are the annotations this is what's important so you kind of have that insight but as software gets more and more um, complicated especially as the data gets complicated it's important to try and have explainability of how your software is coming to the conclusions because we have to make you know patient-facing decisions 
Another example is how efficacious is the software. Is it just technically efficacious as saying, okay, I can identify a nodule? Does it have clinical efficacy? Is there consequence of relevance um, to what it is finding? And then societal efficacy, a great example of that would be lung cancer screening. We have demonstrated societal efficacy. So where do different softwares, where does the concept of AI nodule management fit on this spectrum? Um, certainly early days. Data security is also an important consideration. Where does the data live? Is it going to be in a virtual server? Is it going to be processed locally? Is the data going to be sent to the cloud? Um, what is the level of anonymization? What happens to PHI? Um, federated learning is one of the concepts highlighted to address some of these concerns. Your data is isolated and analyzed in different locations. So there's greater um, credence to data security and then the data gets put together um, and conclusion is arrived at centrally after being processed in, in pieces. Um, more of the same over here. You know, you have a local node that does de-identification and re-identification and data is processed in different locations and sent back to packs. Another example, or sorry, another limitation worth considering is the lack of uh, replication of consistent results in different data sets. We've already seen that in some of the examples. The validation data in silico, you know, does that translate into uh, human use later? You have singular data sets that are being split to do training and then validation. Always, if you have external validation, that improves the usability of the of the results. External validation is superior. And based on one reference, only 6% of machine learning papers included independent external validation. Other um, places that bias can be introduced. So these are different examples of the AI model development workflow and where potentially you may find cognitive bias, facial bias, representation bias. As we saw, you know, if data sets like NLST are being used, they underrepresent um, non-white populations. You have um, sampling bias and then the research output, of course, publication bias. Here is an example of bias. The authors cited the COVID era. So this patient, because of ground glass opacities, was excluded from the study. This nodule over here happened to be benign. So the software lost the opportunity to learn um, features of a benign nodule because COVID excluded this patient. So that's just one example. How do you mitigate bias, um, external validation, and diversity of data? And also as physicians, as we go through these, these decisions and we see different kinds of software come up and we are approached for um, advocating for them at our institutions, um, hopefully attending lectures like this helps physician and patient education to recognize areas of bias and mitigate this. As far as um, job loss, nobody knows. Nobody knows how this is going to make any impacts. I think one thing to keep in mind is um, liability for, for errors. You know, uh, As far as um, I found in, in my searching, there's always that caveat that the radiologist or human in, in or physician, whichever form, has to sign off or bless the reports and take ultimate responsibility. So as long as um, doctors are still required to, to do that, uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't sweat it. Maybe that's a bit of a dark thing to say. Um, would it mean AI can help parse through more data, more scans quickly? And that means as the caseload grows, you need less physicians to deal with that caseload. Probably, possibly, but we don't know. How do you pay for how do you pay for the software? So in, in my mind, I look at this as offensive deployment or defensive deployment. Say we use the software and justify the cost by saying these are patients that we would have missed their cancers, these are patients who we would lose the opportunity to, to treat. Um, so that's perhaps a defensive deployment. In my opinion, maybe that's where we start seeing things roll out more versus offensive deployment. I'm going to install the software. It's going to find all these extra patients. These extra patients will get extra work to our departments and um, so on and so forth. In terms of reimbursement, 
As far as um, the current landscape, there is a temporary CPT code that is um, attached to the Octalem lung cancer prediction software. Um, in terms of specifics, I would say it's worth doing your own research on how this is going to be used. Could an other vendor use this or not? Can we say is it really tied to one particular vendor? I I, I don't know. Um, the jury's still out on that, but I think it's worth um, investigating. Are there guidelines for AI implementation? Yes, there's different guidelines, and they go through the things you may want to look at when writing um, AI paper, for example. This is just one example of the, the guidelines. I think it's worth touching here. You know, if you look at demographics, um, they should be included in detail, so any biases are evident. Again, these are ways to mitigate bias, or, or this is, I think, a very worthwhile framework to look at and see if you are evaluating um, an AI application, what are the things you want to look at when you uh, make that decision. These are um, some of the guidelines going over all these different vendors from um, the UK. The conclusion really is uh, AI is not ready for prime time there yet. CAT scans, for people having CAT scans because of signs of symptoms suggesting lung cancer, not enough evidence to recommend AI, or for CAT scans, for reasons not related to suspicion of lung cancer, not enough evidence to recommend AI yeah, like software. Um, as part of screening, um, the softwares have a potential to be cost effective, but not yet evidence to determine which of them are most clinically um, efficacious and cost effective. Further evidence generation is recommended in different aspects, like how using AI software along clinical review affects clinical decision making and the multi reader study from. Um, Octalem definitely touched upon that. More guidelines going through legal issues, uh, financial issues, practical limitations. Please, you know, feel free to go ahead um, and and look at some of those those things. You know, which one which one do you take? It's it's kind of hard to make a decision. I think these are again some questions that are worth keeping in mind as you decide. You know, how is it going to be funded? Which department will? own the process, which department your institution will own the outcomes? Do you have um, support from a nurse navigator? Do you need more support? Is this going to be software as a service um, subscription model? How is that going to work with budgeting? Is there head-to-head -head data? No, there's not, not for lung nodules. There's some early data coming out for breast cancer, and that's where um, a lot of progress has been made. What would you then go for? Are you going to go for incidental application, um, screening application? Would you use an orchestrator? Will an AI orchestrator or platform allow you to future proof and say, okay, we have this orchestrator installed and we potentially, or, or the vendor potentially may switch out different components and help with the latest and greatest, kind of like an app store. Those are, again, just something to think about. No, no, this is set in store. Um, also, we're thinking, you know, are we being hasty? Um, is really the way to go? Is it? Is it AI? We have pulmonologists, surgeons, oncologists, nurse navigators, tumor boards, um, radiologists. Are we good enough with um, where we are? Your pulmonologist gives lectures like this, talks about screening, sources patients to be screened, reviews scans, scores scans, does the scope, sends them where they need to go, and walks them through survivorship. Don't see AI doing that right now. Um, what might your Franken AI look like? You know, one of the things worth mentioning that I've, I've not touched upon because there's not that much out there is it's all well and good to say we have these nodules and now we're going to do something, but are we doing enough to find the nodules in the first place? Are we doing enough to screen patients in the first place? Um, there are there are some. Um, vendors or startups looking at those things and happy to talk more um, if that's requested. But I think it's worth really thinking on how do we improve lung cancer screening rates? And with improved lung cancer screening rates, we can actually do much more and, and help our help our patients. Um, my personal opinion in the evolution of a software model, I, I don't know the answer. So for example, say you have a software that's deployed in Nevada, where I am, and we have a lot of Coxie. You have a software deployed in Tennessee, where they have a lot of Vista. And you have a software deployed in India, where they have a lot of TB. After three or four years, you know, 
is that software that's running with um, supervised learning or even unsupervised learning the parent software may be from any location but these different deployments in different areas just like our um, pretest probability of cancer changes in fungal endemic areas will will it change for the software and is this going to be really um, natural selection and, and evolution in AI software? I don't know. I think probably there will be to to some degree. I don't know if it will be um, meaningful or not. It's almost like your uh, software is doing um, a residency. This is one of the more important things to take home from this. Um, this document is a multinational document talking about good machine learning practices for medical device development. And the first thing is multidisciplinary expertise is leveraged throughout the total product cycle. And that means you. That means the audience listening to this and interested in learning about this. So we as physicians can participate in this process and make sure the outcome is the most meaningful for our patients. Um, as, I, as I close out the lecture, there's multiple databases. Please feel free to screenshot this stuff. There's another database from the uh, FDA that's been recently updated, actually. Here are other resources to learn more. And that's um, it from me. If there are any questions offline, um, please feel free to reach out. LinkedIn is a good place. I will always plug lung cancer screening. This is my charity to help promote lung cancer screening in Nevada and um, encourage you guys to do the same. Um, Thank you for letting me present, and if there are questions, I would love to go through those. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mehta. This was a really exciting talk. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, I think uh, I'll start with the first one because, you know, this is uh, a lot of information, and um, and I wanted to, you know, I was kind of reading a little bit before our talk about, um, the deep learning, which is not something we are very familiar with as uh, physicians and clinicians. So do, do you think that we have a reliable um, application or software that integrates all of this data, like the pretest probability, uh, risk assessment modules like Mayo, Brook, adding the CT scan findings, adding the, you know, other, other things. I, I know there was a paper um, from Vanderbilt in 2021, talking about the risk stratification of intermediate pulmonary nodules. How how soon do you think that this is applicable? That's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is playing a devil's advocate here. Um, do, do you think that we're adding more dimensions to an already complicated tumor board, you know, with all the genomics and everything, and now we're adding AI data with score system that a lot of clinicians are probably not even heard of or familiar with are we making this too complicated and then that was uh, my two parts question so yeah so i may have you um, repeat one of the parts but in terms of is it being too complicated um i i don't know it it may be and you know you brought up a point about uh tumor board but i have to remember a lot of places don't have tumor board you know, um, world outside academics is extremely different. Maybe, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we also see as you have a AI software, you have different software doing different things. You have some that are just identifying the nodules. You have some that are providing um, risk estimation, risk stratification. Maybe mm -hmm. you're an underserved aid and your goal is just to identify nodules. So you spend your budget just trying to find nodules and making sure we don't miss anything. And we still send those same patients through the existing pathway. Uh, so you know it, it could it could take different forms where wherever you are as far as a multi omic classifier which is basically what we do every day all right you sit in front of your patient you look at history clinical features mm -hmm. radiology mm -hmm. um, some blood based testing and then you come up with a decision as of right now uh, to my knowledge there's no one application necessarily that has mm -hmm. all of these incorporated Certainly, if you have, um, you know, a vendor that's incorporating proteomic features or um, clinical features, you can definitely maybe come up with a combined risk score. One of the interesting things to me out of all of this is the Sybil software, which is open source. So mm -hmm. if you want to form uh, Dr. Nayef AI, 
and go ahead get that stuff and put out a product i mean technically you you could and then it comes down to again what do you pick none of them have been shown to be better or worse than others and again they have different applications so maybe you say hey where we need to succeed is not having patients fall through the cracks fine natural language processing it is um so it, it's it's going to it's going to depend i don't think there's a one-sized fits all kind of situation for this right now it, it's it's yeah. too it's too nascent we just don't know yeah yeah i think it's uh, still in its early stages so um okay sounds good so we we do have another question from the audience um i think it's a little bit more general um when an agile is incidentally identified how does the patient get referred to you i think maybe the the question refers to do you have an ai software like that detects non lung nodules and ct scan i've seen that uh, sort of software multiple times does that generate referrals in you in your own practice or uh yeah sure i can give you um uh, my example so i have a, a unique practice um i'm not part of a hospital system i do work at a hospital but my own practice is my outpatient practice with the cancer center when the in the hospital actually we have three hospitals in the same system and they do employ eon so we have our nurse navigator that uses them um she has a she's fantastic she has a dashboard and through the dashboard they use that to identify patients who have nodules who don't necessarily or or may not you know when she makes the calls um have a um, pulmonologist or an oncologist and if that's the case then depending on local factors um, patient gets referred to me other pulmonologists maybe this just goes to the primary care sometimes insurance drives a lot of these things and uh, that's kind of how it plays out so so yes that's something i am um, familiar with um, we have a third question um, i'll try to rephrase it a little bit uh, i think um, do, do you feel that the incidentally find emphysema for candidates for blvr are uh, more common or more interesting than finding incidental nodules so do you mean like um medically interesting as in yeah I, I, it's a it's a really uh, um, uh, a phrased question in a in a way yeah. that i didn't understand it but i, I think maybe what the what the audience was uh, trying to refer to is um do you think that you know um candidates for blvr based on a ct scan would be missed and incidentally fined by an ai um yes. like a nodules would be yeah so that's um already being um being done through in bios application so they it runs in the background and identifies patients um please reach out to them for more details on the specifics i don't want to misspeak but that's the concept yes identifies extra patients who could be met with and and seen if they are candidates for for valves yes um, and and that's the thing you know if you have an orchestrator and you kind of plug and play different portions then you can at some level potentially decide on where the focus is and also where the capacity is it's one thing to say you know we want to focus on all these different things and and that's fine but does the institution have the capacity to receive all the new patients that are likely to be generated uh, it, it just depends it's very it's very local yeah yeah well well thank you so much this was a very exciting topic uh, very cutting edge yeah. and uh, we're, we're happy to have you again uh, hopefully soon um, uh, as for our audience um, please join us on December 12th very exciting topic with uh, the one and only Dr. Kyle Hogarth and uh, Bobby Tullis and uh, we're talking about uh, um, creating a lung volume uh, program uh, lung uh, volume reduction uh, program or a valve program and I think maybe we'll talk a little bit more about the AI there so so stay tuned and uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.